tēnā tātou, uh, i te whānau, nau mai hoki mai, uh, to planting seeds. Uh, very happy uh, to be here today uh, with a good friend, with a brother. Uh, but before we do get into uh, today's episode, I just want to do a big shout out to You Know Clothing, the official sponsors of Planting Seeds. If you do want to show support to um, this podcast, the easiest way to do that is one, you can either send through some feedback or... Or well, the second thing is you can just go to you know clothing and just drop in planting seeds um, in the discount space and then you'll be able to not only get yourself some fresh threads get a discount but you'll also be able to support the podcast by doing so so big shout out to Joe Webb to Stan and the rest of the team up in Tamaki um, and this awesome relationship that we're building so let's get into it brother Donny no my tata Bro, we've been um you know we've known each other for some time now mm-hmm. um we've had some amazing interactions over the years mm-hmm. um and it feels as though today's the day where we get to connect in this space bro, and I'm Kia very ora. happy and very excited to um have you on the show um you're a beautiful tani uh, you've got a wealth of knowledge you've got a wealth of experience and looking forward to pulling a little bit of that out of you today so no my brother Kia ora, tēnā koe. Kia ora mean and you know that you are who te whakaaro nui mai kia hau, uh, ki te tono mai a hau, te pōhiri mai a hau ki tēnei kaupapa, rana tira a tata, e mihi nei. Kia ora. Mm, kia ora, bro. And so, first let's start off by, um, you know, a little bit of introduction, you know, ko wai koe, um, and then we'll just allow our uh, kōrero to flow from there, my brother. Kia ora. Um, he pai kia noho reo rua a hau i roto i wene kōrero, uh, enari um. tuatahi a ke, nā te mea kai whakatāne tātou, uh, te mānu ka tūtahi, koe nei te tauna o tō tāua waka o mā tātua, uh, ka piki atu ki runo au kāpū te rani, uh, ko toi kai rākau te tanata, e te tanata o te motu. Uh, pūkohu tāiri atu ki te manawa o tō tāua ika, te ika maui tiki-tiki a tarana ko mauna pō hatu tēnā, ko pō tiki-tiki-tiki. Ke whakatau ki a ke ahau i konei, nā pō tiki rāua ko, fi- uh, rāua ko toi, uh, te whenua nā tūhoi te mana me te rana tiratana. Ke ora tātau. Uh, te Kanapua Nasta is my name. I hail from Nai Tūhoi, from the valley, the Farua of Rua Toki. Um, but yeah, born and raised in Australia, actually, a Hoa, wow. um, in a little place called Queenbian, uh, in a Mace- Greek Macedonian family. So my, my Macedonian grandmother brought me up. Um, she doesn't speak English. Wow. She didn't speak English. So um, I was brought up with the Macedonian as my first language, uh, so very staunch Macedonian language and culture. And mm. uh, when I was a, a child, uh, my mother, uh, Fidi Mako Black, um, not name dropping, but uh, <laughs> it's probably uh, important that I do mention my mother so people get an understanding of the legacy that I come from. Um, mm. my, my mother, Fidi Mako Black, uh, contributed a large um, part to the New Zealand Te Reo Māori recording scene. Mm. Um, she pioneered the way and pretty much put her neck on the block back in the day when it wasn't really a thing and decided to um, completely uh, pursue her career in recording music um, uh, through Te Reo Māori mm. to champion Te Reo. And um, yeah, it, so I grew up with that legacy. So from a staunch Macedonian background in Australia, uh, coming back and being brought up in the Ruatoki for a, a time of my life backwards and forwards, uh, that's basically my background, who I am and uh, right. where I come from and a blend mesh of cultures and experiences there, what? Far out. And so how old were you, um, like what, at what age did you, were you raised in that um, cultural experience in Macedonian and, and what was that like travelling back and forth? Sure. Um, look, I was, from the time I was born to age six, I was, my, my parents split up when I was six years old. My mum wanted to pursue her um Number one, she said her music dream, and number two, she would not grow up. She does not want her two boys, my brother and I, to grow up not Māori. Mm. So she wanted us to um, know out there old Māori, so she brought us back, um, six years old, back into the whārua of Ruātoki. Wow. Didn't know what was being said, I didn't know what was being practised, uh, but I felt it. It had a profound impact on me, um, and it wasn't until I was much older in my adult life that I actually turned around to pursue it um, and actually found my true sense of belonging and calling within um, the tikana and the reo passed down through my legacy, so to speak, but I had to go get it. It wasn't just handed to me. Yeah, wow. So, yeah, about age six it started and always backwards and forwards. Um, <clears throat> and it was quite interesting, Ewa, because some of the conflicts of tikana, um, I'll, I'll give you an instance here in, as Māori, 
uh, the most tapu of all tapu things when we say tapu it has an element of atsuatana in there right and that's the two papaku or the deceased body there are so many tikana um, with the deceased body um, and the opposite to tapu is noa mm-hmm. and the most noa thing um, in our culture is food food Okay, so to have food close to the two papaku actually desecrates mm-hmm. the tapu or the sacredness of that two papaku. Um, so you don't blend the two, you keep mm-hmm. them separated. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we take our two papaku to the urupa, the way that we whakanoa or cleanse ourselves to bring us back into our fleshly selves is we wash our hands. Mm-hmm. Now in the Macedonian custom, uh, they have a meal in the urupa wow. with the two papaku. Wow. And the purpose of that is the the practice lines up to the Last Supper of Jesus. So it's part of the Poro Poroaki or the farewell of the two papaku, so they pass over to the other side. Oh. So they have they replicate the Last Supper with the two papaku. And I go to my dad once I found out my tikana two worlds. <laughs> oh, dad. Uh, this, I can't do this. It's um, in my culture. It's tapu. And the, the Maori side, he goes, "Well, boy, you're also Macedonian, and if you don't do this, you're desecrating our customs." I was like, Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, so right there and then, I tested it, mm. and I had a meal with the two papaku, and I'm still alive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wow. You know, I wasn't struck down from a you know a, a lightning, lightning bolt <laughs> from the sky. <laughs> still alive. So ah, it's, you know, but that's just the inner conflict, eh? Or, or perhaps it's just the relationship between the two that you're just navigating, right? And, and how does that look, bro, going yeah. between not only these two cultural lenses, but also there's this Pākehā lens that you also have as well. Not only are you fluent in Te Reo Māori, uh, Macedonian, but you also got this Pākehā um, lens as well. So how does all of this merge for you, bro? I think the key is is everything has a whakapapa, okay? Cool. Everything in the universe has a whakapapa. And that's the f- one thing I love about our Māori culture, it's that it opened me up to the insights of this um, phenomenon well, that everything has a whakapapa and a story that you can trace. Um, so you look for the whanaunatana or the relationship between te ao Pākehā, between te ao Māori, between te ao Macedonian. There's actually whakapapa all there. Wow. Now, one of the most, what I know about tikana uh, a tikana is a practice, it's a physical practice, um, but what it actually has, it has an iho matua, and mm. an iho matua, iho being an umbilical cord, a main umbilical cord, that's, it's an invisible umbilical cord to the spiritual world. Mm. So when we practice these tikana, we're lining ourselves up so that we stay within harmony with the, the, the spiritual powers to be, and that's wow. how we make sure that we, uh, when we're practicing our tikana, that it protects our our tapu sacred practices or our tapu sacred places. That's why we have tikana. Mm. Now, what I found with um, the Bible, a lot of our tikana have been influenced even in Te Ao Māori through uh, Christianity. But the Bible itself and the scripture itself have iho matua connections back to the mm. source. So practicing those tikana goes back to a source. Now, what I've found is, it's no good sitting there and being in conflict. You've got to find the place where everything yeah. sits. Otherwise, you're going to be very irunirua. You're going to be mm. in two minds. So the easiest way to explain it, I always like that whakatauki, all, leads, all roads lead to Rome. Mm. You know, so my mum always said this, whether it's karakia Māori, whether it's karakia kreitiana, the main thing is that we do it with the right intention, a nāku right. that we're going back to the source Pono. and we're lining ourselves up with the other side, so to speak, beyond the veil. Mm. Uh, so what I see with the Last Supper, that or well, eating in the Urupa, it wasn't just a physical practice. It actually had a iho matua conduit connecting to the spiritual world wow. that ha- helps by doing that, you're connecting the pathway for that spirit to pass over. Mm. I think it's beautiful, eh? Wow. I think, you know, a world without tikana, a world without philosophy that connects us to that source... Um, it's a type of a sterile mm. experience in a mm-hmm. sense. So I think spirituality and belief is believing in our practices and the sources of where they come from, mm. the papa of these practices. And then by practicing them, what we're actually doing is connecting ourselves to our spirituality. I love that. Because yeah, not so only is it um, 
is it deeper, but it's also more grand, eh? Kill, you know, having that kind of um, whakaro approach um, to these customs or to these tikanga. Right. And I suppose it's also our, rela- our own personal relationship to these things, right? Because if you're going into this practice and you're feeling a little bit taumaha or you're feeling like, man, I shouldn't be doing this mm. and you do it anyway, mm. that becomes the, the issue with yourself That's as right. opposed to building a... A uh, better awareness of of your relationship to that is going to help you navigate those spaces with a sense of groundedness. Tika, hundred um, percent. I think if you're unsure, I think as long as you understand the fucker pop of the practice, why it's done, and what's the intention, I think there's safety in that. Mm-hmm. And it's oh, nice. Once once you're in that space, you can really take ownership of that practice, and you can feel spiritually safe. Wow. It's when you're unaware that things can be I think spiritually hazardous <laughs> mm. and you're sort of it seems like you could be a bit clumsy um, but if you understand the practice and the fuck up of the practice um, I think there's a, a lot of safety but empowerment in there and there you can take the practice and make it your own and that's sometimes if we don't understand tikana we can't really change it but if we mm. understand tikana we can make it shape play within and fit, it. We can play within it mm. and sometimes it's important to do that because the world's changing every day you can't maintain the tikana that they used 200 years ago to this day and age, mm. you know. Um, but perhaps the um, it may not be able to be the same, but the mode of it is still essentially the same, right? Mm. That's exactly right. So what we do when we um, when we look at, we try to maintain the integrity, mm. the mana, the tapu. So we first and foremost is understanding the whakapapa source of that practice. And then if we shift it in a way, does it still meet um, I suppose the principles of what it was trying to achieve mm. initially. So yeah. yes, and that's protecting the modi. That's protecting the the essence of that practice. Beautiful. And I, I feel that you know sometimes we go looking and seeking for spiritual practices, but I find a lot of spiritual connection just within executing a lot of our customary practices because they are conduit practices that connect us to the other side. Mm. So I think um, you know. It sounds bad, but sometimes, you know, me as a Māori loving my spirituality, somebody dies, I'm like, yay, I can go to the marae and connect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I get to go be a Māori and go and, go and connect with my customary practices. And, mm. you know, I find a lot of um, groundedness and a lot of spiritual uh, fulfillment within our, our tikana, our customary mm. practices. So, yeah, I tika. That's beautiful, bro. And um, over the weekend... Uh, we, we saw each other and man it was a beautiful interaction it was like one of those things we have felt as though um, we were meant to catch up that night and we yeah. just had a beautiful corridor and there was something within our conversation that really just inspired me yeah. um, as I'm sharing with you around my journey of wanting to you know get the ako and yeah. there was something that you said it's not about kare ako e whakao e te reo, you know yeah. so it's not about learning it's about awakening and so we're like can you talk a bit about that, bro? Kia ora. Um, my te reo that I know now is a it's a third language, ne? Um, but when I I've got to a level now where I speak it, I can switch off and it just flows through me, and I'm not sitting there. Sometimes I am calc- There's different modes or different spheres that I sit in there when I speak the language. But there's a certain place where I come sometimes where I'm fully, completely aligned to my real and where it comes from <clears throat> and um, it just flows through me and that's taught me that's I've, I've come up with the whakao no I've intuitively realised within that process that I haven't learnt this language I've reawakened it within me wow and what I mean by that is um, it's in our DNA real is not just a physical practice it's actually uh, he wairua te reo the real mm. is a wairua he Māori tō te reo, te reo has a, a, a life essence, okay, and because we as Māori, our DNA, it's part of our whakapapa, ne? and it's um, you awaken your language within you, you awaken all those places with you, and you connect yourself, and it just flows through you, but it does take time to get to that place, uh, but part of it is getting rid of the noise, mm. the whakamā, the pursuit of excellence and high standards, and I should be like this, I should be saying it right, what I find is a lot of those types of whakaro are symptoms of oppression mm. because we've had to, our language has suffered major uh, oppression. Uh, if you think about us all re- reclaiming our language, 
There was a time where our ancestors were made to despise themselves and their language, and their language was despised in the land where it comes from. Wow. And the traumatic effect that must have on our ancestors to, to make the decision to turn their back on their language, and for us going through the process of revitalizing that, we're actually breaking through those oppressions. Mm. And sometimes that oppression stays within ourselves. Now, we hear about this tall poppy syndrome, people laughing at people. That, that's it. that sounds a bit, you know, oh, he's teats. Mm. What's happened is we've taught, we've been conditioned to oppress each other and keep each other down. But wow. it's, those are symptoms of oppression. So there's two parts to it. It's reawakening your language is number one, but number two is also breaking through the oppression. Wow. And although I might be broken through that oppression, sometimes I still feel it mm. around and you're still fighting those struggles. They're internal and external. Mm. Uh, but yeah, uh, Te Reo Māori is not our birthright, R-I-G-H-T. It's our birthright, R-I-T-E. Mm. It's part of us. And reclaiming it is merely just walking the path where you get to feed the Māori of that language within mm. yourself. So if you go to up surround yourself by people who have very strong um, essence of te reo Māori within them that feeds your Māori and then it mm. awakens you and inspires you. So that's my whakaaro around, wow. around te reo Māori and, and around the journey of reawakening our reo. Wow, yeah. that's, so, that's mean. Whakaoho hia te Māori o tō reo, whāngai hia te Māori o tō reo. E mm. koe nga te rāko reo. That's beautiful. And I've, I've heard that a lot, you know, um, he wairua tā te reo. Um, and there's also just what you said is something that I haven't necessarily sort of been aware of before in terms of the oppression part of uh, Te Reo Māori and how that's still a generational, intergenerational kind of impact and it comes in the thoughts of um, whakamā, you know, being shy it comes in the thought of not feeling worthy enough or not feeling good, en- good enough it's those limitations that we have in our own minds that has been passed down to us and so for you to sort of language it in that way it's like whoa there's there's more to it than just thinking that it's just us mm-hmm. you know this has actually come from um you know what our tipuna have gone through it's also as you said what this feeling that um the tall popping syndrome feeling even that's been pulled down so it's beautiful that you've been mm-hmm. able to make these kinds of connections because for me understanding it or or even just observing and, and hearing you that I haven't fully understand it, um, mm-hmm. can't fully understand it yet, but as I go on my huarahi, bro, these are going to be the helpful gems that are going to help me uh, fuck all who he talk with you. Kia ora, mm. Yeah, um, I think we'll be lying to say that there's not a trauma associated with loss of language. And what I find te reo is a place for me, <clears throat> ko tōku reo te tūrana waiwai o ku whakaaro. Mm. As we know a tūrana waiwai to be a place of belonging, absolute belonging, birth, right, whakapapa, right to be at that place, to stand and to be who you are according to your whakapapa. What I find with my real Māori that it gives me that internally. Mm-hmm. No matter where I go, I carry my tūrana waiwai with me. Now, if you think about our umbilical cord being cut and our whenua, as we know as Māori, you know, they, they bury the whenua to reconnect you to the land. There's a second umbilical cord, which is a spiritual umbilical cord, which I believe to be the Māori language. It spiritually connects our umbilical cord back to Papa Tuanuku and to our whakapapa, oh. you know. And um, so the oppression of our language was actually the severing of that connection to our whakapapa and to our whenua. Oh. So you can see why it was designed as such to be like that. Now, that has a profound traumatic effect on us. And now we're trying to revitalize and reclaim that. And all these feelings that we're feeling inside ourselves, those are all real, real mm. feelings. And although I've, um, I'll give you an example, <clears throat> I've um, come out of the Panekiritana o Te Reo. So I've revital like for my revitalization journey, started about six, seven years ago, and I pursued it all the way into Te Panekire Tanao Te Reo, where I was accepted to be the last intake. Te Panekire Tanao Te Reo um, is like, uh, it's called, the English word is um, the Academy of Māori Language Excellence. Okay, mm-hmm. It's somewhat of a elite Māori language development, but our, they, they, we're almost like the 
SAS of language mm. revitalization, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> kia tika, te reo, kia, kia rere te reo, kia Māori te reo. Um, so what happened, so me going into that course, I had no belief in myself. I thought, mm. I'm going to drop out. Like, I won't, I won't be able to handle this. And I beat myself up all the way through it. Mm. What actually happened was because I worked so hard, I actually ended up uh, passing with honours. Mm. And I found that by me trying, the only way to try to remedy these feelings that I feel, this this trauma, this disconnect, is by the pursuit of excellence mm. in Te Reo Maui. But what I find is, the deeper I go down that track, these feelings are still there. Wow. Because sometimes I feel good and it flows, and then sometimes something will trigger me, and it still comes back. So I still haven't quite got on top of it, but I am aware of where it comes from, mm. and um, I'm, I'm I'm saying that the loss of language. Has you know the loss of our mother tongue, which connects us back to our umbilical cord to Papa Tuanuku and our Faka Papa, has quite a profound effect mm. on the way we feel about ourselves, on the way we are spiritually connected to our Faka Papa, to our practices, and who we are in this whenua. Um, so, you know, when we feel these feelings of Faka Ma, when we feel these feelings, am I Maori enough? You know, that's what it's dressed up as. That's what it sounds like, but it's the feelings. Eh? It's mm. the way you vibrate. It's the mm. perceptive. It's the perceptive experience that you're having, mm. beating hearts, panicking, you're in survival mode, mm. you know, all these traumatic responses. And then you think about it, it's like, you know, it, it's perceived to be quite a volatile sort of environment, but really a lot of that's quite perceived as well. Mm. But it's, you know, I, I have to try to think where these feelings come from and what happened. So wow, I, I think there's two things probably to look at is when we're re revitalizing language, are we really addressing what happened? Mm. You know, are we really addressing what actually happened and how it was taken off within your own whakapapa line? Wow. Do you understand the history of the oppression of the language in your own whakapapa line, number one? So do you, how do you address that within yourself and heal that, number one? Number two, how do we reconnect that even before learning a, e, e, or u, <laughs> before learning grammatical structures and things like that, how do we reconnect that? Um, what's the spiritual induction back to the language? How do we induct people back into the taha wairu o te reo? You know, so I'm, I'm, it's got me thinking, where are the indigenous um, or the Māori framework language revitalization models to to support this process. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a thesis study that needs to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, then we start developing the language. See, um, I asked my uncle Tain Lohotim about this. He's amazing, very creative. And I'm like, uncle, and I explain what I just explained to you. Mm -hmm. He goes, kei te e He goes, when the Māori language actually first starts in the womb. Wow. It starts in the womb, so vibrations, textures, mm. sounds, you know. And he said it's important, like the way he teaches the young children the language, he does it through ori ori, through singing. Wow. You know, so we, and he goes, we, we need to learn how to shape our mouths, how to sing, how to learn and feel the vibrations of the language and integrate the feeling and the way to of the real mm. before we start doing all the calculate you know calculating mm. all the grammatical structures and things like that because that stuff can be quite sterile sterilizing it's quite parky here it's quite way parky. of of looking at it too isn't it's, it? it's dealing with the intellectual side with it it's, mm. it's dealing with the intellectual side of the real maori only wow. and what i've found is from the natamatoa movement once we've been recognized that the real has been oppressed and it's our right that the government has poured all this funding into it, but what it's done, it's created academia. Mm. Māori academia, which has developed Māori, te reo Māori academic excellence. Um, but, you know, that pathway is not for everybody. So mm. if you think about it, they served back in the 70s when that um, kaupapa happened, they surveyed te reo Māori, and 20% of the Māori population, um, only 20% was speaking te reo Māori. 80% of the, the population had been disconnected. Mm. From that time, 50 years later to this time, we're still maintaining the roughly the same threshold. So what's happened in between? Mm. You know? How it was, you know, like say 50 years ago, yeah. you said, you know, where there was a 20 and 80% split between mm. Māori fluent speakers and mm. Māori who aren't speakers or disconnected. And you fast forward to 
you know, 50 years later and you say it's roughly still the same, it seems as though there is still a, a big gap between. And I feel listening to you, perhaps the gap is as simple as connection and disconnection, you know, and their path to finding connection mm. is not just a one way sort of like shop like you f- you'll find connection and doing it this way Kill. whereas what i'm hearing you sort of talk about through the conversation and your own focado is that we need to explore other areas Kill. right and what i'm hearing mainly from you is like what what connects you to your um paha wairua um in terms of this maori relationship that mm. you have to yourself and, and to your spirituality and and that comes in the formation of um oro you know the vibration Kia music ora. comes in the form of, of other things that mm. just feel natural for you to go down that huarahi rather than feeling like we need to all just do it this way is that something along the line Drew? that's that's exactly it um, mm. you know it seems like a for our people who are disconnected and don't have a pathway back in to wanting to reconnect themselves to their language, to their legacy, to their birthright, so to Mm. speak. Uh, It seems like academic pathways are the way. Mm. And it's better than nothing. Mm. I'm I'm definitely not not discounting the academic pathway. Um, But does it, is, is it geared up to again to to be able to it's not for everybody um and some of our people who i suppose feel the barriers i mm-hmm. mean first and foremost you've got time privilege you've got uh, our people at home with many kids they haven't got the time mm-hmm. to go away and do that sort of mahi other people they've been disconnected for so long that the experience could be so traumatic or so you have those barriers of the fakama they should know mm-hmm. it's, it's too it's quite a scary uh you know sort of prospect to go into that mm-hmm. into that world so I'm, I'm thinking, what are you know some other programs, some other types of um, kaupapa. kaupapa that we mm. can do to reconnect our people mm. and to do this induction process, pre-induction process into reconnecting our people before we even go on a language journey. Yeah, and right. And what happens in the language journey? We see we're, we're looking for the pursuit of academic excellence, say hey, all that sort of stuff. Is the language, and you know, like when you look at academic practices or academic frameworks it's all gearing you up just to pass tests mm. it really is mm. um, when I was teaching I disagreed with the frameworks when I was teaching I'm not going to say the place where I was teaching but I was teaching te reo Māori <clears throat> and what I actually found was that all I was doing was teaching the students how to pass the tests mm. so the test can be marked off and sent to NZQA so they can check it off and justify the funding come back and I was trying to keep students there mm. I felt like I was prostituting our language for a buck Mm. Didn't agree with it. And um, what I found was that the non Māori were sticking it out because mm. they were academically inclined, and a lot of our Māori people were dropping off. They felt like it was disconnected from what they were actually trying to come and do. Wow. Yeah, and I had to work hard to integrate the Taha Wairua, to integrate Nga Tikana, ki roto i Nga Mahi Whakaakui Te Reo. I had to work really hard to integrate um, the spiritual connections, the philosophies, the matauranga, to re-induct them into the language um, and, and into the culture mm. while I fed them the language through the process. And it was, um, none of that stuff was in the curriculum, at, in the curriculums at all. And that's what I, I found that quite... Um, mm. um, big barrier. Big barrier. And, and it, it was just, it, it falls short. And, and, and I think other people deserve more than that mm. and it's not saying that we're not trying to offer that but I think we need to um, in these jobs and in these institutions really st- like ask ourselves like um, you know are we are we doing all that we can to really address and really connect our people you know mm. um, or are, oh. we, are we just pushing them through courses and um, ticking the box and getting the funding and getting paid mm. you know so that's that was the argument that was now that was a str- internal strife for me yeah i saw that uh the other option is oh well you know the other pathways to go do something about it so i can't just sit here and talk i've got to go, <laughs> yeah, gotta go find something eh? <laughs> well, i've got to go and but i think this is part of <laughs> i think this is part of their process though you know with within your own journey within your own experience you're able to see the sort of gaps that mm. you feel something could be beneficial in this gap mm. and i suppose that's sort of just where you are in your journey you know getting to a certain level in sure. your own personal real journey you've now realized like holy hell you know i can now see mm. 
um, perhaps why it's it's very hard to minimize or to make a bigger gap between the 2080, mm. you know, and even making that like a higher percentage, you're now able to see as to why those sure. barriers could be the way that they are. Um, so, Mihana Kaukwe, bro, for, for doing your beautiful mahi. And every time that um, I am around you, your ngako. Um, really encourages me to not feel shy and it's beautiful to because that seems to be the reason where I get a little bit fuck mm. um, you know ki te kōrero i te reo Māori is when I'm around people mm. who are very matatau and I feel incompetent mm. you know I feel like oh I get way more shyer but mm. I've never felt that around you you know you, mm. you allow me to go reo rua yeah, or right. I might start a conversation in Māori and then I'll finish it in English but you always just respond as if I was just speaking normally so mm. I really do admire that about you um, Donnie and so um, looking forward to going to a uh, tohekura wānanga this yeah, weekend bro so I'm looking forward to that so I'm on my journey um, because I was also talking to um, Te Aurere Pe Whairangi mm. and um, I was talking to him about where I'm at in Te Reo Māori and he said oh you know he, he tāne whakarongo Māori you know, ngari kāre koe he tāne, kōrero Māori. Mm. You know, so there's a difference in our understanding and comprehension mm. um, in this journey where I can understand and listen, mm. but I struggle to put the words in my own mouth, kā mm. uh, So I'm on, I'm on that journey. I'm excited. I'm committed. You know, having a pepe, having my son and family, it's it's really awakening that within me. So, yeah. you know, if we were to go into a different direction, um, Donnie, like what else has been going on for you, bro? You know, like when we talk about um, things that are happening in your space or, or or what's on your heart at this point in time that you would like to share, bro? Yeah, kia ora, te One of the things that I've been working on recently, um, it actually has relationship to what we are just talking about. And um, I've brought some of New Zealand's um, well-known um, music artists together, uh, ones who are connected in te reo and ones who are also not connected in te reo and we're creating or recreating a waiata. I uh, won't let the cat the head out of the bag just yet, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just in case uh, my promotional team will give me the whip. <laughs> uh, but we're actually creating the way the, to break open the conversation that we just spoke about mm. um, and also the documentary series uh, to bring awareness around this conversation and to just to encourage people um, that the way we're feeling is absolutely valid and it's true and it is hard. Um, and just to try and encourage people, no matter the barriers, no matter how hard it is, just to, to take their first steps to reclaiming mm-hmm. their legacy, Kia reclaiming ora. their birthright, uh, which is not just language, but their place of belonging within themselves and who mm-hmm. they are as Māori people. Um, so, yeah, really looking forward to um, creating that kaupapa and, and um, you know, getting it out there. So I suppose that's one way for me um, to back up what I'm saying. Is That's to, mean. I'm scene. looking looking forward to seeing you know what what that looks like, how oh, that right. comes out, and the conversations that are going to be based on um, around that. And if we're to like, what has been your biggest awakening within revitalizing Te Reo Māori within you, bro? Was there a moment where you're just like, wow, this is amazing? The sense of absolute belonging within myself. Wow. The absolute wow. Proud the, the the groundedness that I feel. And the sense of belonging that I feel uh, with inside myself when I'm completely in my in my zone, so to speak, mm. or when I'm when I'm in that environment where where it's express express where I can express it to its fullest. Wow. You know, sometimes I feel the best when I'm standing on the marae and delivering a fai kōrero because I'm just completely zoned out from my flesh, so to speak, and, mm. and something else just takes over, and I'm. I feel like my there's roots that grow out of my my feet and just connect to Papa Tuanuku and I feel like my pu moto moto is just open and you mm. know that's it and just channeling through and I'm just completely connected. Wow. Um, so you know moments like and that doesn't necessarily have to happen just on the marae. It can just happen with a conversation mm. with somebody. Sometimes it can happen by myself just doing karakia. Um, yeah, even just doing karakia wow. sometimes, you know, I'm, I walk, walk up moa every morning. Sometimes I just sit there in the dark and just recite karakia after karakia, sometimes off the cuff, sometimes recited. And it's just feelings like that. Eh? It's, again, it's having that sense of tūrana waiawai within myself, mm. you know, and that's what I find my my real is just an umbilical cord that just connects me every wow. single time. It's just and that is, sense of belonging. Is that common across um, many of your peers or many of the 
people who sort of get into that space? Do they have a different, obviously they have a different connection to it, but what is something that you can um, easily see? Is it, is it confidence? Yeah. Like what, what do you see within other people who are standing within their, um, their Māori tanga? There's two, I see the exact same thing that I, that I feel. I perceive to see the same thing. I, I think one of them is uh, hihiri. Mm. And the hihiri is, there's a, a whakatauki or there's a kōrero in a karakia. Ko tahi te hihiri i kakeaia tāne ki tiki tiki ora. Ni te hihiri is that, that light bulb moment that happens. Eh? There's, that, there's that type of, you know, when the light bulb lights up, kwa, kwa hinātore. Mm. Okay, so there's, a, there's an invigoration of the whakaro, of the intellect, where it's just, you're really inspired. There's that part and there's also a mauri tau. Mm. A Māori tau is like a, a real sense of groundedness within your puku. You're completely present where you are. You feel very invigorated and you feel very inspired. And it, your connection of who you are just flows through you and with your peers around you. And it's a very reciprocal process. That's the beautiful mm. thing about it. It becomes a type of exchange of Māori. You know, so mm. I'm, as we're talking, as I'm talking to you and I'm, my intellect is completely lit up mm. and I'm exchanging, I'm, I'm, I'm tying together all these ama- amazing creative types of pathways mm. and exchanging it over and the people are inspired and they're giving it back to you. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Mm. So absolutely it happens. Um, and it's probably, I would say, one of the most beautiful places that I love to be um, in, in my living experience. Wow. Yeah. And what has this been like for you being a whānau as well? You've got two beautiful babies, yeah. got a beautiful hoarangatira. Mm. What has te reo Māori sort of like meant for you in a whānau context? When I met my hoarangatira, um, well, kōrero Māori māua kia māua, I was like, oh, tick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to marry me? <laughs> my wife, Jordan Te Arani, uh, she's from Te Wai Manakaku, um, beautiful girl. You see her very fair skin, she doesn't look like a Māori. Mm. And then he te kōrero wa ia, oh, māta toru tana reo tūhoi, very thick accent. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, I fell in love with her. Um, when we had our first boy, uh, Māta Aumua Te Awarua, we were in Australia, and I made a contract with myself that I will not speak uh, English to him and that I will... At that stage, my reo wasn't great. It was mm. okay, though. Um, <clears throat> but I uplifted my wife and myself. We had just moved there, got an amazing job in the mines, making big money. We completely left that life, come back to New Zealand, um, and yeah, I went and signed up to... Anamata, mm. to learn how to become a teacher uh, through the Māori, Māori language because I was paying a scholarship at the time, so I was able to learn my language and become a teacher. So that suited me for my children and my pathway. Mm. So that's where it all started about six years ago. But what happened was that I put everything into my real Māori pathway so that I can completely fuck a Māori, so I completely translate the Māori world or create a complete Māori environment for my children, my family to, to be brought up in. So I don't, I've got two tamariki and I don't speak English to either of them and they speak beautiful Māori. Um, it's beautiful, it's got a lot of rewards and it's also hard. Mm. It's hard and it's moke moke. You know, you sometimes... I think back to some of the beautiful things that my son, he had this amazing language structure and some, now he's lost some of that mm. because the English speaking world is just so dominant mm. and the influence of that is just so strong. And sometimes you've got to choose your battles, you know, and just, you know, let, let some of those things go and then just work on, you know, moving forward. So those are the challenges. But the benefits of it is that, you know, I can sit there and completely converse in te reo Māori with my children. <laughs> so the, I could... I, I dare would say that the life force of my language is my children, mm. uh, my children and my wife. If it wasn't for them, I would be completely isolated and moke moke. Mm. Um, so one of my strategies actually, I suppose, or one of the, I, I really pay tribute to my family because they've been a big life source of the awakening of my own language. Mm. And as my son has got older, I've had to pursue uh, language or, you know, um, language efficiency and language adeptness to a higher level so I can translate every single concept in the world to him. Otherwise, I can't walk the talk, mm. which means kōrero Māori sanko e kōrero Pākea mai kia hau. Mm. You know, ko te taurira te tino kai whakā, ko te examples, the greatest teacher. Love that. And if you're going to preach it, uh, you've got to come through with, you know, the, you've got to be able to put uh, principle into practice. Mm. You've got to be able to come through and, and do that. So, 
Has it been like a challenge for you at times, bro? Being like trying to be an example um, of that message, and 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 I'm sure that sort of like translates to many different parts of your life too, right? It's not just here in this space. Yeah, well, looking from the outside, people are always praising me. Oh, raweke wo tamariki. But internally, I'm having, I have challenges every day internally. I'm like, mm. oh man, you know, I need to try harder with them. I should be better. Should this, should that. Always still having, mm. you know, all those fakaro. And I think a lot of that is a byproduct of the heavy, the the strong speaking, English speaking world that we live in, mm. you know. And, and a lot of those fakaro are actually a type of response because I'm actually really muke muke and I'm lonely to to be able to stay in my language all the time. Mm. And I really want the best for myself and my tamariki. And then when I don't get that, I start getting hard on myself. Mm. And that's the challenge. Wow. That's the challenge. And the challenge really comes from the absolute love I have for my language. Because wow. I'd rather just be there all the time. Mm. Um, but then there's opportunities when I do get it. And it's not flowing through me, and I'm giving myself a hard time because I'm not I'm not as you know modi to as I'd like to be. So yeah. it is a constant challenge and a struggle from the outside looking in. You know, it, it seems like the pathway like mm. it's a, I'm doing an amazing job, uh, but sometimes you sort of forget that and you get caught up in the rut of rut. the challenges. That's right. And I think a lot of that comes down to gratitude and appreciation mm. for how far you. Come. I think it's also just. Like from the outside looking in, it does look good, and and I think it's it's about acknowledging that, like, mm. hey, yeah, we are actually doing really well here, but it's just your own internal right. dialogue that sort of not necessarily seeing it for what it is. That's right. You know, because there's that sort of facado of your mindset that's just in the pursuit of excellence that's that right. we sometimes um, diminish the what we already have. You that's know, because right. it's hard to when you're in the pursuit of excellence mm. and you're seeing life as as it is, you're always looking for the improvements as opposed to looking for, like you said, the gratitude, the appreciation mm. for what actually is. And, and sometimes that sort of helps us to bring us into that space of balance as well. And there's the challenge there of, of you know, trying to always improve. Has that always been something that you've had within yourself, Donny? Yeah, d- definitely. Eh? When you're, you're passionate about something, um, you... You know, you're always in that pursuit of that journey, um, and when you when you stay when you're being distant from that journey, mm. from that you know that type of uh, pathway, so to speak, um, the challenge is not to get hard on yourself. The challenge mm. is not to let the feelings of moke moke or being lonely for for that cope up or that pursuit to not let it get on top of you. Mm. And this is very true for te reo Maori. You know, sometimes it could be. Um, I, I'm at home with my wife uh, and my tamariki, but a lot of the, my only stimulation I get sometimes is just watching and reading, um, watching YouTube, reading material and things like that. But you don't necessarily get that reciprocal mm. uh, type of um, activity that really helps grow and feed your Maori and te reo Maori, so to wow. speak. So you know, because life challenges of you know working. Every day, um, being isolated, there's no there's no community to go speak. They're mm. Maori all the time. It can be quite challenging. Um, but I think the the key is is to be um, grateful and appreciate that you you know of how far you have come with what you do have, um, mm. the, the taonga that you do have, and, and understanding hierarchy tour. There's mm. also always another day tomorrow, and there's another kaupapa to go mm. and be part of. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it gets a it gets. It, it, it's like um, we all know um, fire te iti kahurani uh, ki te tu o hukwe mehe mauna teitei um, you know to pursue te iti kahurani which is that that desire that you're you're, for, you're longing for and you're always going for it and if you're to bow down let it be a lofty mountain mm-hmm. but what I find with my journey in te reo Māori he whai na iti kahurani mutu na kore mm-hmm. <laughs> it is a never ending <laughs> pursuit and it it's a double-edged sword because, <clears throat> one, if you don't look after yourself within that pursuit, you can get quite down when you don't get what you want. Mm-hmm. But the other good thing about it is that you're never satisfied mm. and you've always got that burning hunger. You've always got that burning hunger to come, you know, to always seek. Um, it's not seek improvement, but to always seek enlightenment, mm. you know, to always grow and flourish within the kaupapa. And the hard thing is... Uh, you know, having whānau, having babies, having 
jobs and stuff. You can't always just take off to That's go to right. work, but they do that for you. Mm-hmm. But we're very lucky this day and age with technology uh, that we can keep connected, um, you know, and I, I think um, – coming into the abilities of technology, I think we can start creating online one and then thing like that, mm. things like that really help. But another thing that's really helped me is that I've changed my whole career path to mm-hmm. developing te reo Māori. So as I'm developing myself, I'm working and helping people develop themselves as well. So That's you know, beautiful how that... Yeah. He hua ka iroto i tēnā as well, eh, bro? Yeah, and do you, um, can you also break down our wānanga, bro? Because obviously there's different... You know, there's a whare wānanga and things of that nature, but I love wānanga, you know, in terms of, like, in-depth, meaningful spaces of learning, of sharing. And so what is your whakaro of wānanga, bro? Because it's a term I like to use. Um, It's a term I know, you know, people in te ao Māori sort of love that space as well. So, you know, how are tēnei mea te wānanga? Tērā ka te tiro Māori tātou ki tēnei kupu wānanga, if we were to look at it from a Māori lens and look at the whakapapa of wānanga, I think the first wānana that was ever had uh, was with Ngātua Māori um, when they were when they sat down in the condensed mm-hmm. state of their of Ranginui and Papatua Nuku um, in their embrace, and the children were growing and they wanted to venture out and they wanted to come into the world of light and separate their matua. So the first wānana I think um, happened there where they sat down and a wānana is a very, it's a, it's where everybody um, has autonomy over their whakaro and they get to test their whakaro into the pool of knowledge, so to speak. So everybody contributes into the pool of knowledge and everybody deliberates over that. And a lot of, one of the beautiful things about wānana is you usually come to a consensus. Mm. You don't always have to agree. Mm. But you usually come to a consensus and an understanding and saying, okay, this is the pathway that's going to be chosen. And as we know, Fido, Tafiri, Mate, they didn't agree. Mm. But the consensus was that Rani Nui and Papatua Nuku were going to be separated. Kamana Itera. And that was, that was um, accepted because there was a consensus, like a majority consensus. So I think a lot of our tikana and our practices actually where you come together, you have a wānana, and then you have a, you come to a consensus, and it's the consensus that gives uh, the essence mm-hmm. of that knowledge and makes that knowledge, uh, it sort of solidifies that knowledge, and then that knowledge becomes practical and it becomes practiced and used. Wow. So for me, wānana is a sense of coming together in, in a mutual in a mutual way, having autonomy over our own tāuna, over our own whakaro, sharing those whakaro together and then coming to some type of understanding and consensus. Mm. Whether they, whether we, we agree or not, we still respect each other. And, um, you know, usually we come to an agreement and enlightenment happens there where you share that enlightenment. Mm. And, yeah, that, to me that's one. And a, yeah, and I, and I love the whole space of it. And, and I liken it to being like a... Um, it's sort of more so like an invitation and it's a space for you to to allow your thoughts to be heard in a way or for you to receive something that makes sense of your whakaro, you know, because um, there's, there's beauty within knowledge, there's also beauty in sharing and there's also so much more learning in the ability to share. And I think that's where... Um, I guess the the gems are or um kei roto uh, i e kai ngā hua, you know so when we're sort of receiving all of these things we then know how to implement it into our own lives and that could be um you individually or it could be you as a team perhaps or it could be you as a whānau could be you as a hapu iwi and I think it's just mean how we have that kind of um tikanga or that kind of process um within who we are as Māori to naturally um sit around to kōrero to share based on whatever the topic is it could be something hohonu mm. it could be something sort of like perhaps a little bit more heated um but at least we have that space where we can come in and share and with the intention of hopefully everyone gets an opportunity to be heard. Yeah. Um, I think with Wānana, it's a place where knowledge is explored mm, but also cool. expanded upon. Mm. So, then they mount a on a Māori, it's not just traditional knowledge that we've inherited, but you can also create. You can expand upon that mātaurana and 
re um how to kupu hanai re repurpose it for the time the day the context for the situation mm. so the beautiful that's one thing about one and the one and as a place it should be a safe place to be able to explore to test for karo mm. and if your for karo is not quite on the mark that's why you have your other peers there to that's be able right. to help you yeah, to mm. to um um to, to you know basically it's a place where you can test mm. um so the difference, I suppose, with a you know one and then being taught being taught is this is the literature, this is what it is, mm. and you take it and you just regurgitate it and you replicate. That's it. That's right. But with uh, Mato on the Maori, um, you know, we 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 get we have our teacher or our tohuna and they will teach us their Mato but then their instruction is to take this Mato and find out how it's relevant to your. Mm-hmm. world to your experience and how can you expand upon that what is your contribution back to the matauranga mm-hmm. so if you're just practicing matauranga that you've been taught you're just replicating what's already been done mm-hmm. so you're not necessarily practicing life principle of creation and evolution and process mm-hmm. okay wow. uh, but matauranga maori truly would be maori being natural it's it's a recited or it's looking at an example that's been practiced, but it's then grabbing it and looking at it in, in the in the current world and looking at what the evolutionary process of that matauranga is and how it needs to grow and mm. expand from beyond there. Love that. And I think within… There's those, responsibility there, eh? There's, there's major responsibility mm. and to, to maintain the integrity of that matauranga. Um, and some of the ways we do that is referencing, mm. referencing where the matauranga comes cool. from. It's part of whakapapa of matauranga. Um, and then when we expand upon it to make sure that the essence of that matauranga, um, you respect the process and what it is, you're not disregarding it, mm. uh, but you're utilizing it for greater good, so to speak, mm. as opposed to using it for self-gain. Now, wow. that's, now that's, that's something I sort of see quite a lot. Uh, these days, and especially because with the Treaty of Waitani, uh, let's say the, um, the Waitani Tribunal. So the Waitani Tribunals come through now. We've seen that Kopapa Māori has a lot more standing in the modern day. Mm. So much so that it's been commodified. Yeah, it's been commercialised, and you see that Matau and Māori is used quite a lot um, because there's a price behind it. Mm. And the problem with that is. Well, for the right price, anybody's an expert. That's you know? right. Mm. And so, you know, there's the fine lines of, I suppose, selling out Matauranga for self gain and things like that, or changing and playing around with Matauranga. But I think um, anything that any Taona Māori, Matauranga, te practices Matauranga, you need tikana to mm. go hand in hand with that Matauranga. It's tikana. That actually acts as the protector of the, of the oh. integrity of matauranga. Wow! So you know sometimes matauranga people they refrain from giving their matauranga over because they don't believe that the intention is correct. Oh. You know, and that's tika, mm. and that's tikana. Tikana is maintaining the tapu of that matauranga, and when we say tapu, tapu being sacred, it means it has a conduit. To the spiritual world, mm. you know, so it has that whakapapa, that connection, that atsuatana in it. So that's why when we have a wānana, we have a karakia, we open it up, we make sure that we're connected to that realm and we make sure the tikana process is in place to protect that matauranga. And the purpose for that matauranga that's been shared and the way it's used, the whakaro or being mindful, the tikana needs to go with it to protect it. Mm. So if we're using matauranga within commercial organizations within government agencies it's okay to use the matau on the maori what's the purpose mm. if the purpose is to give life to the kaupapa to the people kei te pai tera, it needs a tikana to go with it to protect and maintain that mm. and to make sure that that's maintained all the way through sometimes it needs the right people to protect that matau mm. um so wow you know that uh, makes sense mm. it does and it just makes sense it feels too it has like that um, sense of balance and also, like as you said, that sense of safety and protection of that taonga, which is the matauranga. Yeah, right. And um, something that 
that just came up for me is we're spiritual people, eh? Kia ora. You know, and so why in your perhaps whakaro, why do you feel there's this element of fear for our people to tap into our te taha wairua? Like, is it, was it about what we first said at the start about the oppression that was there, the trauma that was there? Is that part of our disconnect to that taha wairua? I like that whakaro. Um And I think that whakaro, <coughs> excuse me. I think that's quite a, a valid whakaaro if you look at the Tohuna Suppression Act. Mm. So the Tohuna Suppression Act was an act um, that was passed through Parliament to suppress basically our spiritual practices. Um, and if you were caught doing those spiritual practices, uh, you were sent to, the jail, sent to jail as a loony, mm. you know. And I think there's relics of that still passed down. You know, there's, there's still that stigma attached. So I think it's a great whakaaro to explore. Mm. Number one, I think. Number two is the fear of the unknown. Mm, so, like I said, wow. mm, like I said, uh, it's quite important when we're doing, doing our customary practices to understand the fucker papa of what we're doing and why we're doing it. What's the intention? And I think if your intention is right in the first place, there's a lot of safety in that. Um, but then, if you still are not sure of, of the practice itself, um, be cautious in the sense of be respectful. With that practice, don't throw it around, or you know, to just to, to to I don't know, to create a bit of a show, so to speak, mm. or to put yourself in the line, like to say, I'm the guy who knows these practices. Um, you know, each practice needs to be respected as well, because those practices or those tikana, they are conduits again, mm. and they are they are connected, and um, sometimes there's spiritual repercussions that can happen physically to a person. Mm. Um, so it's quite important. Um, yeah, wow. I, I think we are spiritual people, but um, I, I think it's not something to just go dive into. But, eh? but, but not something to just go dive into. There's a process. Mm. Um, there, there. You know, it's you don't just get information or you don't mm. get knowledge overnight. It's you know they they say noho puku eh noho puku. Mm. So koto mahi he noho he fakarondo he tetiro he kopi. Me kopi te waha. Mm. And it says that you, you sit, you observe, you listen, and you stay humble and you don't ask questions. Um, and what that actually means is that um, you've got to, it's, it's humility to sit there and, and look at the practice, to feel the practice. And it comes to you after time if your mm. intention's right. But just diving into it, exploring it, being clumsy, that could be quite um, dangerous in a way. It could be quite dangerous. Mm. So we are spiritual people, um, but there's also a a process um, yeah. to, to follow in that practice here. Yeah, and um, I feel for me in terms of, you know, following along from this corridor, understanding that, yeah, we have we are very connected in terms of our spirituality and there's, you know, there's a lot of beautiful, um, I guess, things to find or to be revealed the more we um, navigate through that space. But it's not about diving um, head first, but I think a good gauge is, Whatever you feel, there's there's this feeling of being pulled mm -hmm. that sometimes we receive, whether it's an intuitive feel. And when you can answer or respond to that pull, then there's this element of what I feel anyway in my own personal experience is that I'm meant to go this way. I, I don't resist it. I just allow myself to go a little bit deeper into this huarahi. And then I find my way, myself back in terms of balance, regrounding myself. But when you can use your own gauge of this feels a little bit uncomfortable but it also feels where I should be going mm. or this feels good I should you know carry on down the space it's just more so having that self-awareness of yourself of what you're actually asking within yourself is there a question you've been pondering is there something that you're trying to find more clarity on and sometimes this space of te tahawairu, the spirituality space is something that really provides so much more because it is unseen it's only your relationship to it and sometimes we think we seek tangible things mm. to give us the answers but sometimes it's very no i wouldn't I, i won't say that it's limited i won't say that it's like shallow but it's perhaps going to take a lot longer to sort of find what you need externally. Whereas if you f go internally and trust yourself, then perhaps you'll find, or perhaps um, there'll be something that'll awaken in you. So yeah, that's my whakaro on that, bro. 
Yeah, tika, tika, tika. Um, I find uh, to answer the the ofakaro of some of my experiences, when I have a deep burning question or desire to to understand something in the spiritual realm within our Maori tikana, um, it could take three, four, five years to get the answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's the process. Um, sometimes wanting the answer doesn't mean you are entitled to the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to, not in the sense of grind to earn it, mm. it's got to be earned in the sense of is your intention long standing mm-hmm. and is it for the right reason? And if you really want that clarity, it will come to you. Wow. But it will test you, you will be tested. Like, so when you, uh, I listen to your kōrero, um and yes, the way well will guide you. The way will guide you to the enlightenment, but it will go it's only through trials and tribulations, mm-hmm. sometimes pain, sometimes suffering, um, all sorts of, very similar to when Tane ascended the heavens to get the nā kite o te mā tauranga ne. E harei te mā i mā manuai hotana piki, mm-hmm. it wasn't easy for him. Uh, he was faced with many trials and tribulations, uh, but eventually he attained enlightenment. Mm. And I think the pursuit of every question enlightenment that you are after goes through that process. Through and it's the same in our external reality too, in terms of we're seeking things internally and it's the exact same in this external realm, in this external space, in this physical space, is mm. that perhaps we want the car, perhaps we want the relationship, da 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 there's that same process mm. in terms of it just doesn't come, mm. you know, but if you can hold steadfast to that and is your intention right is it aligned to that then perhaps you'll seek what it is that you desire and it's the same if you're trying to answer a deep question within yourself it's the same huarahi and so for me we've been speaking heavily around te tahawairua but it's so interconnected to where we are now in this sort of like physical plane in this physical sense so it's beautiful to um, navigate through these kinds of things, but you also build this interconnectedness, not just through your own relationship mm-hmm. to your spirituality, to your physical sense, or also to your mental sense, mm-hmm. but it's to people, to places. Everything becomes sort of like a bit more um, synchronized mm. in why things are or how things are unfolding in your life. Tika, I find that to be very true that. Uh, the state of consciousness that you've come to, um, that you'll find that you'll find so many indications of reciprocation and relationship <laughs> to that type of to that consciousness in your mm. physical environment. And um, for me, the pursuit of enlightenment is uh, within Maori knowledge bases. And what I do is I seek understanding of the world around me mm. uh, through the through Mato and the Maori through a Maori lens. Uh, because it just gives me my understanding of my fuck up and how I relate to the world. Mm. Now, when I say consciousness, is when you integrate it into your present consciousness, yeah. and you could look around and go, "Oh wow, I remember that quoted all about Tafaki and how he grabbed the main vine, the Akamatsua, which grounded him." So when I go and I'm expected to do something or I'll perform something and I'm grounded within myself and I'm holding on to the akamatsua metaphor- met- metaphorically and I'm very rooted and grounded mm. and you know those are types of integrated knowledge into your current mm. present consciousness wow. so I find wow, there's mana yeah, there yeah, there's well, so much beautiful energy there too well it's 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 dependable it's safe mm. it's sturdy because it's um it has a whakapapa. Mm. You know, it's knowledge that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And our people built their customary practices and they run their whole way of life through these type of frameworks, frameworks eh, which are kōwairuna kōrero, or their esoteric knowledge, knowledge of the, um, yeah, that, that's exactly right, their frameworks and mm. blueprints. And what you see, although they might just be puraka or stories, they're actually frameworks of the principles of life. Mm. So if, you, if you've if you got a mathematic mind, so to speak, and you watch patterns play out, and you can liken those patterns to a lot of our kōrero, and you can see similarities, similarities where the lessons are, you can see where the truth, the truth is, the, 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 where, where mistakes were made, so to speak, or where things went wrong, and that information comes through also. Mm. So it's, it's amazing to have that enlightenment, 
uh, but the key is is to integrate it into your present consciousness and to run your life according to your that's why I think principles values they come from those places mm. life experience but you know it's one thing to have an understanding of that knowledge but the other thing is to test that knowledge against life exactly. experience and then it's integrated and then you can confidently say yes yeah 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 and that's right it, it comes down to you know one thing it's it's learning and and having the awareness or or actually being in a space of receiving certain mātauranga and it makes you feel a certain way and it helps you sort of make sense of some of the challenges that you're having internally or or even externally but what you do with that is actually sort of like what turns that knowledge into understanding you know is just through the implementation and practice and i've had some um experiences of my life where i speak to that experience mm. because i've gone through it and i've applied certain things and so i've learned how to articulate my process where i received the information i implemented it and now my relationship of the outcome that that Kia sort of unfolded whether it was a good outcome or mm. bad outcome there's a fucker popper to that Kia as well ora. and it's so um yeah it's such a, a beautiful space to be and the thing that comes to mind that i want to ask you donny was um you know there's this whole corridor um around you know like how you said you're not maori enough mm. like you know what what can you say to some of our whanau who may have that kind of um might have that kind of whakaro brewing in them kia ora. i think the whakapapa of that type of whakaro comes down from the trauma of being oppressed for mm. being maori mm. And I think it's a symptom of the time when our ancestors were told that being Māori was of no value mm. here in Aotearoa. And if you want to make it in life, um, you need to you need to let those ways go, and you need to assimilate yourself into a Pākehā life. Now, I think a separation divide happened for some people that impacted them quite a lot where they completely separated in front mm. of the people they held they held true um, although all the pain that they suffered for holding true to that and I think um, what's happened is because of the mummy that they've felt and the separation of the other people it turns into a type of where they despise them in a sense you know but it's again it's all symptoms of oppression and there's a, they're despising possibly Māoris who might have sold out. Mm. But if you look at the whakapapa of that, it's actually pain. Mm. It's pain. Wow. Now, I think later on, I don't think that was actually the case at the time, mm. but I think generations down as it passes down, I think those are the types of whakaro that, that bru- the feelings that happen, mm. I think those are the, th- see, I, I think Feelings create thoughts. 100%. You know, feelings create thoughts. So when we feel these types of uh, feelings, we try to make sense of them. Triggers and the thoughts. Tri- they're triggers. They're traumas. They're traumas that sit on our, on our narco. Mm. So I think when we try to put make sense of these feelings, and, you know, if we're usually fight or flight type of people as well. Yep. So the brain is wired to fight or flight, and sometimes the fight is oppressing our other people mm. you know but really the feeling is they're just trying to navigate the feeling mm. but i think Love that. absolutely that again it's not our fault that mm. we feel like that and it's not mm. our fault that we are disconnected that mm. was done by design and i think we need to understand that and love each other a lot more and support each other and understand that we all got the short end of the stick mm. some were lucky enough to hold on mm. and some were completely disconnected but in saying that holding on was still a struggle mm. you know wow. we're, we're all we're all this it's life's hard mm. <laughs> but i think we need to deal with our own feelings and look around and have more empathy and understanding and compassion, that, eh? compassion that mm. that we're all feeling the same mm. doesn't matter wow. what you know so sometimes our maori people who are we're in the pursuit of excellence and reclaiming our journey, and that becomes a type of remedy for feeling like that. Wow. But I believe that if we don't deal with those feelings, that they still surface. Still surface regardless. They still surface. I, I find that they still surface within myself. Wow. So again, coming coming out of the Panikiritana um, with um, honours uh, for the Taharil, and then I still feel like my is not good enough at times. You know, cause I still find my brain, well, my 
triggered into that certain type of a car or mm. that I have to get myself back out of that rut. Mm. You know, um, it's 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 um, and I think it's quite pertinent to the environment sometimes that we mm. live in and the way we perceive ourselves. Mm. And I think those are all symptoms of the oppression that's been inflicted upon wow. us. Yeah, so. so it's just about having that kind of level of compassion, empathy, not just for other people, for our tipuna, but also for ourselves in some capacity. Because, like yeah. you said, it's it was. Um, you know, it was passed down without even us realizing it. And sometimes there's that confusion of like, why am I feeling like this? I'm interpreting, you know, my reality in these conditions and it's reaffirming what I feel as well. You know, because like how you said, you feel something and it triggers the thoughts and now your senses are open to align to what you're thinking. So you're only seeing the things that are biased to how you're feeling. Man, I'm not Māori enough. So now you're seeing the things that are identifying yourself as you're not Māori enough. Whereas if we sort of change that story, we start to see things that are biased to that Mm. as well. But it's good to have that contrast. right? I do believe it's good to have that contrast of feeling like, man, I'm not Māori enough, only to get to your moment to be like, nah, stuff that, I am Māori enough. You know, you find that space where you can only feel that enough in order to you to move into a direction that best suits you and so me and brother we've been having such a delicious hakari here um around you know just how important our real is and how it is um you know our birthright r-i-t-e how it's our sense of belonging um how it helps us to feel connected um to not only ourselves but also to our whakapapa you know to our tipuna um who were before us and who saw this for us they envisioned us to to be who i guess who who the best that we can be um but also our connection to our whenua our tātai whakapapa to papa tuanuku me ranginui and so you know there's that um whakapapa ko ranginui kei runga ko papa tuanuku kei raro ko hau kei waenga nui Mm. and so for me to, um, I guess, close the soft bow and, and I want to ask you a question. Um, and there's a whakatauki, um, he mokopuna ahau, uh, he tipuna ahau. Mm. And so that speaks to, you know, I'm a grandchild, um, but I'm also an ancestor in the same sentence. And so how does that sit with you and, and how does that enable you to show up in the way that, that you feel you need to show up in that in that regard? Tēnā koe i tērā pātai e hoa. Um, one of the cultural practices or one of the ways of life that we had was the intergenerational transmission of knowledge. Mm. And that's also how it was transmitted from generation to generation. Uh, and there come a stage within the history of Māori people where that was cut off. Mm. Um, and now we're in the renaissance period or we're in the period where we're trying to reclaim that um, and it's happening um, and it needs to happen and it needs to keep happening with well, your whakatauki in particular it gives me the conviction of heart I have this absolute conviction of heart and it, that your whakatauki relates to that where I understand that for a lot of whakapapa lines that 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 severing of that intergenerational transmission of knowledge has stopped for that whakapapa line. Mm. So what I have made my life journey and my soul contract is to put myself in that space (laughs) to connect people again so that I've done it for my children, I've done it in my own family, and now I've made a life journey of it. That's my whole soul purpose and calling is I put myself in that space to help that process of people's intergenerational akamatsua, koeo, connect them to their iho matsua and for their kōrero to come down so then they can hand it down and it could be reconnected for them again. Mm-hmm. That umbilical cord can be reconnected in their line. So that's what I do in my mahi. Mm-hmm. Anyway, however I can do that, I'm there. Wow. You know, so I, 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 if that's why when we have conversations, you know, and I love to impart knowledge and talk because uh, you know for me in principle what I'm doing is just grabbing that umbilical cord and saying mm. yeah bro <laughs> grab onto this and let's go <laughs> mm. <laughs> so. wow that's beautiful bro and um you know thank you for that mahi thank you for that intention and I suppose you know it's you're sharing that cord or that matauranga for those who I, I suppose are open to receiving it mm. and there's something that comes up for me is that man there's that 
um, desire for people to feel connected. There's mm. that desire for people to feel, you know, like they're in a space of belonging. And there's many ways, I believe, where you can access that. Mm. Um, but if you are, you know, Maori and you're here connected to this whenua, I feel there's that gap there in terms of who you are, your connection to this whenua that can only sort of like feel awakened through this particular journey and so having someone such as yourself and the many other tohunga and the many other um you know real maori warriors who are just out there who are just championing the beauty of it the connection and it's just amazing to be um alive Mm. during this renaissance but also to even be in a space where i can connect to people such as you and to create this platform and this podcast where people can start to to receive that kind of mātauranga and knowledge as well so uh, um you know those who have taught you all of this um, um, because man it's just beautiful to see someone who's not only strong in, in their journey but is also strong in themselves mm-hmm. to be vulnerable enough to share their own challenges despite the accolades yeah, despite right. how it's seen uh, from an external perspective so um, thank you so much for coming on brother and just want to hand it over to you for some parting words mm-hmm. um, you know if there's anything on your heart um, just to close us off uh, if there's one thing from all this kōrero that I, I would love this kōrero to achieve is that this is your connection bōhiri in you to come back <laughs> <laughs> to come back to your birthright to your sense of belonging um, we somehow realise within this journey that we're not who we're meant to be according to mm. You know, when, when I start, when we start learning who we are, we realize we start grieving what we've actually lost. Wow! You know, we start grieving what we've actually lost. But um, what I want to say is, is that grieve. You know, tani hia te tūpapaku Grieve and send send the death on the way, and then come back to life, come back to the world of living, and start your journey. Doesn't matter how small, how large. Start finding. Every little bit of kaupapa, something that you can just attach to that we, that that can feed your life force and that can connect your umbilical cord back to to your connectivity, back to your place of belonging, according to your whakapapa and your birthright and who you are. It is your absolute birthright, um, and it's within you. You're not going to learn it. You're reawakening it within mm-hmm. you. It's in your DNA. Know that. Reclaim it. Be proud of. Be proud of it. And um, let the empowerment happen from there. Uh, that's my encouragement to you all. Beautiful. And understand that we're all, no matter what level, we all feel the challenges. Um, and that's part of the journey. Uh, because there's a lot of mamai that's happened. But through the other end of mamai is a beautiful, beautiful place to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just really want to bohiri everybody who is on that journey, who is thinking about it. No mai hoki mai ki tō whakapapa, no mai hoki mai. Kito ao Māori. Tēnā koe, brother. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to the people and to give this message out. Kia ora, tato. Kia ora, brother. Thank you so much. Beautiful, um, heartfelt message and definitely uh, felt for myself and feel privileged to be in your presence, uh, to be on the receiving end, you know, in this space for this beautiful kōrero as I know that this kōrero is helping me awaken you know, what is within me and being around this kind of conversation, being around this kind of modi is all um, good energy for the process that I'm going through. So um, thank you so much, brother, for your time, for being here. Um, and yeah, I'm just so proud to be in your space, bro. So thank you very much. And to the whanau, uh, thank you all so much as well for continuing to tune in. I hope this was a delicious kōrero for you. Again, if you want to support the podcast, man, go over to the link, go on to You Know Clothing, get yourself a hoodie, put in planting seeds, and um, that is a way for you to show that support. So, emihana yeah. kia koutou until the next episode. Thank you very much. And brother, thank you. Tēnā koe. Tēnā